So here we are at the end of our day, and we've heard so many great examples of how we need to think outside of the box, how it's so important for us to empower our students to take control of their own learning and have that agency, right? And I remember the first time that I ever heard anyone talk about this. It was from this old British guy on YouTube. Maybe you've heard of him. Sir Ken Robinson. He's made a few cameos today, hasn't he? And I remember watching this video over and over and over again and thinking to myself, what he's really talking about is student empowerment, giving our students the room and freedom to explore their curiosity and to be who they want to be. And I thought, I need to empower my students. So I said, tomorrow I am going to go to school and I am going to do this. And the problem was that tomorrow became the next day and the next day and the next day until a year went by and tomorrow had yet to come. And it wasn't because I didn't believe in this idea of student empowerment, but it was that as a classroom teacher with all of the other things on my plate, I had no idea where to start. It was one thing to be inspired to take a journey and another thing altogether to know what road to take to begin that journey. I didn't know what to do. I had heard from a friend about something called 20% time and a lot of other folks were calling it do whatever you want day. It was time where the kids were going to be able to not have objectives on the board or I can statements, but really get into that dig into creativity time. And I thought, I'm going to do this. I'm finally going to take that step. So I went home and I lesson planned the crap out of it. And I was like, OK, I'm going to make this speech in front of my kids. And I got to school the next day and I stood in front of them. I puffed out my chest because the day had finally come. I was going to do what Sir Ken said to do. And so I said to my kids, today is do whatever you want day. Today, we're going to get to explore who we are as humans. And I went on this huge speech, and at the end, I took a step back and I waited because I knew it. I knew in my heart of hearts, this was my slow clap teacher moment. My dead poet society, they were all going to get on their desks and say, oh, captain, oh, captain. I knew I had nailed it. But none of that happened. They just stared at me. And I was thinking, what's wrong with them? I was like, go for it, guys. Come on, let's do this. Innovate. Be amazing. And they just kind of sat there. And then they would start working on things. And they'd get frustrated. And they were fighting. And I didn't understand. So I said to one of my students, what are you waiting for? What's wrong? And she said, well, you didn't give us a rubric. <laughs> and I thought, oh, shit. <laughs> I'm that jerk who killed creativity. I waited too long. What do I do after my kids have already lost their creativity? What do we do when we come to an event like TED and we get inspired to change that narrative, but our kids have already become rubric zombies? How do we change that? How do we rediscover playtime and curiosity? So I, I went to my colleagues and I said to them, I broke my kids, how do I fix them? And they said to me, I hear what you're saying, but unfortunately, practices like creativity and innovation and transformative thinking, that's for charter schools or schools that are doing well. We work in Chicago. And I work in a network of Chicago public schools that are all high needs. And they said, we believe in these ideas, but there are standards our kids have to master or they're going to shut us down. We don't have time to let kids play all day. And it was so depressing to me, and I was so upset, because why is creativity and, and, and innovation a luxury? Why is being a human being something that you have to be in the right zip code to earn? Why can't all of our kids, even if they're in the inner city of Chicago, have these opportunities? Why don't we have 3D printers? Why don't we get to innovate? So. My boss said, calm down. Um, and she gave me this book called Switch, How to Change Things When Change is Hard. And change is super hard, friends. You know that. And as one classroom teacher, and now I work with a network of schools, how do we change an entire establishment? Well, Switch tells us to look for the bright spots. They're areas where change is happening organically. And to learn from these bright spots and to bring them back into our systems to change for the greater good. And I've been lucky to find bright spots in my life. 
So I'm going to tell you about a few of them. One of them is a four-year-old named Finn who I met at a conference. And he was looking at my laptop and he said, hey, hey, that Chrome thingy, that's the Chrome logo. And I said, yeah. And he goes, you know what it looks like? A Pokeball. If you don't know what a Pokeball is, it's the egg that Pokemon hatch out of. So he said, can you find more Chrome logos on the internet? And I said, sure. So I went and did a Google search. And he said, you know what would be super cool? He said, what? And he goes, if you could make them explode, can you find explosions on the internet? And I was like, sure can. And because he's four, I found cartoon explosions. Um, and then he said, OK, no, no, no. Make the Chrome Pokeball explode into lots of little Chrome Pokeballs. He wanted to do like an explosive Chrome reproduction. And so I said, OK, and I got out Photoshop. And he's like, you're doing it wrong. Let me do it. So he took my computer and navigated to MIT's Scratch program, which for those of you who don't know, is a program for kids to learn how to code. And he started animating these Chrome Pokeballs exploding, all in a 15-minute time frame. Now, what really struck me about this, besides this kid's super smart, is that he had learned how to cultivate his own curiosity. No one had told this child to stop asking why, and no one had told him when he woke up and started wondering, what's the objective and I can statement of what you're doing right now? <laughs> he was given the freedom to follow the breadcrumb trail of I wonder if, I wonder if, I wonder if, having no idea where it was going to take him. And when he got there, he was allowed to run amok in that space. And my kids had forgotten how to do that. They were scared to create. It was as if when they walked into our school buildings, there was a giant sign that said, free will, free zone. All of the creativity was sucked out of their body. They were able to be human kids at home, but at school, not so much. So I had to remind them how to cultivate that curiosity. Another girl, she's a 13-year-old named Samantha, also inspired me. She was presenting at a conference, and afterwards I talked to her and her father. And they told me this really great story about how that previous weekend, um, Samantha had done something quite interesting. You see, as all 13-year-olds do, they, she had chores. She had to do laundry, vacuum, clean her room. And her dad said, you got a lot of chores piled up, my friend. You are staying home today. You're not going to go out with your friends. You need to clean the house. And Samantha really wanted to see her friends. So dad went off and did, I don't know, whatever dads do. Maybe we should ask Brad. And then, um, and then he came home early. And he was surprised when he came home early to hear all of her friends' voices in his house. So he starts being like, all right, here we go. I got to be a dad. And he walks into the laundry room and finds Samantha on a Google Hangout folding all the laundry. Now, Samantha saw a problem. And instead of shutting down, like my students have done, they see a problem and they immediately get frustrated or shut down or quit. She learned how to outwit obstacles. At no point did she huff at her dad when he said, you can't hang out with your friends. At no point did she say, well, I'm going to have a super boring day folding laundry. Instead, she said, no problem. I can do both. I got hangouts. She was able to see past a problem to a solution and to persevere in problem solving. And that's a talent that my kids had forgotten. The final bright spot I want to tell you about is my own childhood. When I was six years old, I moved from Boston to Orlando. And when I got to Florida, I was surprised to find that I was the very first Asian in all of Florida. <laughs> um, that might not necessarily be true, but it felt like it, because no one in my entire class could stop talking about all of my facial features. They're like, what's going on with your eyes? Are you always squinting? Your eyes are so small. And for a six-year-old, this was very hurtful, and it went on and on. In fact, this was an autobiography they had us write in first grade, and I asked my teacher if I could fix my face before she put it on the board. And by fix my face, I meant cross out my eyes. And it was really hard for me when I first moved there. None of the other kids would let me play in their reindeer games. So I developed a lot of my own solitary habits. I like to color, draw, write, and cut. I was a master cutter at age six. Safety scissors be gone. Um, and, but don't feel bad for me, because I was able to publish great works. Maybe you've heard of them. The Golden Horse and Piggy. So, you know, Jarrett Krasoska, there you go. Um, 
I need to get into children's publishing. Um, but what happened was, as I got older, I started bringing portfolios of my drawings and writing, and I'm not quite as talented as that children's book author we heard from late, earlier, but I loved it. And like him, I liked getting my imagination on paper. So um, I would take this to recess, and slowly kids would come over and want to look at what I was doing, and they started bringing their work and showing what they would do at home. And all of a sudden, my, my colleagues, my peers, were no longer remarking on the features of my face, but the features of my writing and drawings. And we created a writing club, and we would hang out after school, and I would come home and I'd say, Mom, can I have my friends over? I've got friends. It was so exciting, and then um, I started, they started, we started sharing work, and I would edit their work and my work, and I was so good at editing papers, I decided to grow up and become a teacher so I could get paid to do so and edit everyone's work. Um, <laughs> I, um, at the age of nine, I published my first novel, The Wishing Street, and um, I hand-wrote all of them because I didn't have a mimeograph or a photocopy, and I passed it all out. And this was a huge moment for me. I still have, obviously, all of this work because it was really powerful in my childhood. It was a turning point for me. And what was really important was that I had so much time to play and explore. At no point did my parents say, go do this or you need to do that. They got me paper, they got me stickers, they got me file folders, whatever I wanted. And because I had so much time to engage in my interests, the play became purposeful. If you let kids have the freedom to play and explore their interests, eventually they're going to build something out of it, and they're going to find meaning in their own play. The problem is, is we cut them off and play too soon, especially in school. So I decided to revisit Do Whatever You Want, and I went back to my classroom, and I decided to take the three learnings from those bright spots to my students. I decided to let them cultivate their curiosity and helped them and scaffolded, letting them follow that yellow brick road of I wonder to wherever it might lead them. One of my students found a wind-up toy in my classroom and spent the entire afternoon under a table racing it until he decided he wanted to build a wind-up toy. The obstacle here was is we didn't have any of the materials to build a moving robot in my classroom, so he had to outwit that obstacle, and this is what he and his friend did. I put tape right here so he can eat any Cheeto garbage. And this was great. He would run up and down the hallway and be like, look at my robot eating. And then I gave them several, not just days. I wasn't like, the following three lesson days are going to be for play. I gave them as much time to play as they needed until they realized that what they weren't actually interested in was robots, like cardboard robots, but robots as in programming robots. They wanted to build like an army of T-1000s to take over the world. And so they decided they wanted to learn how to code. And so they dug into coding and they were so geeked about the idea of coding, and this was novel in our school, that they created a commercial so all of their colleagues and peers in the class could learn about coding as well. I only got 20 lines in my Chromebook. I, I, I'm coding. Writing in HTML. This is coding awesome. So we put that on YouTube so all their friends could see, and every day they'd come in and refresh it and say, look at all the views I'm getting, and I'd say, that's you, stop refreshing. But the point of that was... They were so excited to have people see their work, and despite the fact that like probably 500 of those 525 views are them hitting refresh, kids in the school did see it, and they were inspired to start coding. So the students' curiosity, the fact that they could persevere through that problem of, oh, I can't, they would have given up robotics if, if I hadn't taught them, let's keep tugging, to giving them time to play came into something that was inspiring all of the other kids in the building. Now, before we leave each other today, I want to tell you about one bright spot that happened very recently for one of my good friends. We're talking about student empowerment and voice, and this is an incredible example of what happens when you let your kids loose on the world. Lindsay Rose is a fifth grade teacher on the south side of Chicago in a neighborhood called South Shore. But you probably haven't heard of South Shore. You might have heard it by the name the media calls it, Terror Town. 
And sometimes you might hear how rappers and other celebrities are not calling my home city, Chicago, Chi-Town or Second City, but Chirac. Now imagine being 10 years old and waking up in your house and walking to school every day and having to hear people call your neighborhood terror town, your city, Chirac. They didn't like that. And they couldn't understand why news trucks only come to their neighborhood to report murders. And so Lindsay Rose, a math teacher in one of the most high needs, at risks, whatever you want to call it, elementary schools in the entire city of Chicago, said, I am going to do something about this. I am going to empower my students, and even though I don't know where to start, and even though this isn't my subject, and this hits no common core state standard I can think of, I am going to give them space to talk. And this is what her students made. We saw your news trucks and cameras here, and we read your article, Six Shot and South Shore Laundry Mat and Another Man Shooting in Tear Town. We saw the news reporters with fancy suits in front of our laundry mat. You spent 24 hours here, but you really don't know us. Those who don't know us think this is a poor neighborhood with those abandoned buildings with the wood covered in the windows and broken doors. Those who don't know us saw the police on the corner and think that we're all violence and drugs. They see the candy wrappers and empty juice bottles and think we don't care. Uneducated, jobless thieves, you'll be scared of these heartless people. When you see us coming, you might hurry up and run to your cars and lock the doors. Then speed down these streets at 60 miles per hour like you're on a highway, trying to get out of this ghetto. We want you to know us, we aren't afraid. We know that man at the corner. He works at the store and gives us free lemon heads. Those girls jumping rope are Precious, Anaya, and Nivea. The people in suits are not going to finish but to church. That little creepy dog is Sionis, Lamar's dog. We are the kids who find crates so we can shoot hoops. When the sun shines here, it's not God saying he wants to burn us, but he sees us all with bright futures. Those who know us look at the ones who want to go to college, not the ones who dropped out. If you listen, you'll hear this laughter and chatter from the group of girls on the corner who are best friends and really care about each other. Do you see the smile on the cashier's face when the kids walk in? Why? Because this neighborhood is filled with love. This isn't Chirac. This is home. This is us. Empowering your students, giving them time to innovate and pursue their curiosity and things that matter to them at their heart is not a luxury. It is not something that we have time to wait for tomorrow to start. Don't be like me. Don't wait till it's too late and you've already killed curiosity. Do it today. Do it for them. Power to the pupil.